Hello and welcome to our chat. This is just a conversation that we would like to have with you about the expectations, engagement, and inclusion using groups in medium and large enrollment classes. I am Dr. Kim Godwin and I am an instructional designer with MTSU Online as well as a faculty member within University College and the College of Education doctorate and graduate programs. With me today as a part of this conversation is Mrs. Tara Perrin. Tara, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi there. My name is Tara Perrin. I am also an instructional designer at MTSU Online, and I'm an adjunct faculty member for University College at MTSU as well. It's good to meet everyone. Thank you for joining me today, Tara. The purpose of this on-demand chat today is for us to have a conversation with you about what might best benefit faculty as well as our students as we're dealing with medium and large enrollment courses. With decreased funding due to global events, funding, and all of the other things that we have going on, those have impacted the overall enrollment at our institutions. And then by process, we have seen an increase in the size of our individual course sections to kind of mitigate those funding concerns. As such, we are seeing courses that at one point had 25 people in them growing to be 30, 40, even 50 in an individual class. And let's not talk about those rumors about a 15 person graduate class bumping up to 30. No, <laughs> that is not okay. <laughs> so this conversation that we're going to have today is really going to talk a little bit about that and how we can best help you come with ways that you can engage your students in a meaningful and purposeful way without you or them feeling overwhelmed. And as we're thinking about these things, one of the things to think about is that we are not talking about a massive online enrollment course. We're not talking about MOOCs. We are talking about ones that typically in the past would have been considered best practices at about 25 students, ones that really give you that opportunity to have that level of engagement. We look for when we're thinking about the community of inquiry of communications with the faculty member, connections with the content and the materials, as well as engagement with our peers and peer interaction. Uh, so that's really what our focus is, is those courses that have expanded to be a little bit bigger than they once were, but are still being designed and developed with the intent of having that level of interaction with peers as well as faculty members. So Tara, as we're looking into this, did you have any questions that you might want to ask today? Yeah, I think it's really important to recognize that many faculty, including myself, have bought into the engagement and diversity of perspective that's so important in discussion boards. But when your class size is growing to 35, 40, 50, how do you manage that? Like as a faculty member, just how do you manage that? It's, it's so different. No, that is a great question. And it's definitely something that people are dealing with every day. You know, one thing to think about with that is that if you have a course that has 50 people in it and you are using the, let's call it the traditional initial post and then two to three response posts, when you log in as a faculty member and you look at a discussion board, there are 150, 150 initial and response posts that you need to look at. You probably just had a physical reaction to me saying 150 posts. And while we're thinking about that and how overwhelming that concept might be for you, think about that in terms of a student. When a student comes into a class and we know that you set that little part in your discussion that allows for them to not see things until they've created their initial post. So they've created their initial post and they pop in and there's 49 other initial posts and another 100 response posts waiting for them. That's overwhelming. That can really create a, a feeling of anxiety. They don't want to know where to start. They don't know who to pick. They don't have any idea what's going on. And that can really cause somebody to kind of shut down a little bit. You as a faculty member are shutting down because that is 150 that you have to grade. The student yeah. is shutting down because there's just too much. It's just too much to look at. Uh, and so what one of the examples that I think is really a good way to look at it 
and what we've seen uh, quite a bit of successes um, is create some groups within your discussion boards that create that opportunity for the students to engage with a much smaller group of people. I would suggest probably about 10 uh, is a good place to start. You can go a little bigger, a little smaller, um, depending on what your needs are. Uh, but within that, I would really encourage you not to go less than five, uh, because five really allows for you to have your initial and then response to two to three people, if that's your requirement, and also allows for at least one or two people <laughs> not to participate. Um, so, if you have about 10, that's going to give you an opportunity for the students to engage with more people during the discussion, um, see more perspectives, see more information, but not have 50 to try to manage. Uh, one of the great things about those groups, too, is that within D2L, we can set them up ahead of time. Uh, you can set them up and have them assigned, you can have them auto assigned, you can self enroll, whatever it is that works best for you and the purpose of your activity. Uh, and then one of the other great things about groups and discussions as well as groups in assignment folders is that you can grade them as a group or you can grade them individually. So when you're looking at that, what's great about that is if you've got a discussion board that has 10 people in it, each has an initial post, and then each has responded two to three times, um, you're really looking at the concept as a whole within the group, as opposed to individual posts. How did the group as a whole do as a part of this discussion board? How is it that they're engaging with each other? What kind of comments are they having, conversations? You get to look at it as a whole and then give one grade with general feedback to everyone in the group. So it's much faster for you and it's easier for you to manage than it is individually clicking on people within your discussion board or even within um, a, a assignment folder, you really would have the same thing for everyone. Um, a couple things to think about with some of those discussions too, because this is kind of a, a good time to side note, talk about that a little bit, is that uh, in the past, uh, discussions were considered how we met our contact hours for online learning. Some things have changed and workload is no longer measured the same. And so we don't need a weekly discussion to meet contact hours. We need to have discussions so that we have that engagement with our faculty member and our engagement with our peers. But we don't have to have one every single week in order to meet those hours um, for contact purposes and for accreditation. It's a different structure now. So maybe as you're thinking about your discussions and how you might feel overwhelmed with 150 posts per week, do you need to have one every week? Maybe consider that fewer and more meaningful discussions have a bigger impact. Uh, and thinking about you know, some of those conversations that people have too about that uh, discussions might seem like busy work if you have fewer and those that they're doing are more engaging, they won't seem as much like busy work to you or to your students. I know some of the things to think about too within those activities is that when we have uh, group activities or we have group discussions, uh, or we have group things going on, it gives our students an opportunity to really look at things from a diverse perspective, uh, from uh, additional insights that they might get from other students or from each other, or even just new ways of looking at things and learning things. When we're in groups, we get to work with people who learn differently. So people who may not have the exact same um, processes for learning as us. One of us may be more visual. Somebody else may be more auditory. Uh, some of us may have um, needs for adaptive learning. And if we've never had an experience to interact with somebody like that in a learning environment, a group actually gives us that, which is so great for down the road um, if we are are doing activities or something within our personal or professional life down the road. When we're in groups, we also get a greater opportunity to interact with people that have different perspectives and see things from different lenses. Um, I have my own set of lenses based on my own life and my own experiences and my own upbringing. So I see things from my perspective, uh, helping other people be in a group together, we get to see those additional perspectives. Uh, it does lead to a, a diverse understanding of concepts. Uh, you and I might read the same thing 
and get a slightly different understanding or slightly different meaning from it because of, of how we read it or what we were thinking about at the time or some of our past readings and learnings and having those opportunities really help a lot. Uh, and then there's the uh, an additional of we get a chance to really work with people that have a, a different set of skills than we have. Um, some of us are really uh, very great at video. Some of us are really anxious about being on video. Some of us are very good writers. Others really struggle to put their thoughts into words. And so being able to work with different groups of people in different ways expands that as well. Um, and then one of the, the final thoughts to think about in terms of some of those benefits of having that group and how it can help you and how it can help your students is that when we're in a group of, of 10 or so people, we tend to be more confident in making those deeper connections with our classmates. Uh, we're more confident in uh, giving our own opinions, in conveying our own perspectives, in challenging what other people are thinking, um, asking those additional deep engaged questions. When it's a smaller group, when it's a huge group, we're a little bit nervous about things. Um, we don't know who we feel comfortable talking to. We haven't developed any kind of trust yet. So it's really kind of overwhelming. So a smaller group really does actually enhance um, cultural awareness and DEI and perspectives, uh, in addition to really creating those opportunities for um, diverse learning skills and um, promoting awareness and diversity. What other questions might you have? Well, when you're talking about those things, I'm thinking about like, say, what I do in the classroom with projects or presentations. Um, and I know a lot of faculty think that they can't do that online. What are your comments about that? Oh, absolutely. You can do these online. Uh, and I really have encouraged it. And I've seen a lot of growth in them, both in classes that I teach as well as faculty members that I work with as an instructional designer. Um, it's no different. It's no different than a face-to-face -face class. And you might think, what, what do you mean it's no different? They're not standing in my classroom. They're on a computer. Uh, true. But in your face-to-face -face classroom, uh, chances are that they do most of their group work prior to the presentation of their project or the actual presentation or whatever it is they were working on. They At least we do. hope so. Like, right. <laughs> we would definitely hope. I mean, there's probably been a few. <laughs> we would hope that they did it ahead of time, that they worked on it outside of class. Well, that's the same. That's actually an asynchronous learning environment that your face-to-face -face students are already in when they're meeting together as a group ahead of time to plan and create and develop whatever that project or presentation is. Uh, so it's no different. You're giving them the same expectation. They are having to, on their own, determine how and when they're going to get together to, to work on whatever it is that you've assigned. Um, you know, one of the, the benefits I think that comes from that is that in today's world, we don't only have meetings and work in a face-to-face -face space. I mean, this that we're doing right here is a prime example of that. Uh, we are constantly working in a virtual environment for meetings. We're working with people all over the world to create projects and proposals for things. So being able to work in this asynchronous virtual environment within D2L or, or outside, but within D2L to create um, whatever your project is actually provides a skill set for future employment uh, or um, other activities that a student might do in a fairly safe environment. Um, creating those, those levels of presentations and things within a school setting really does help you practice and gain that confidence that will help you be more successful later. Um, you know, some of the other benefits to it that is one that I don't know that I necessarily thought about in the beginning, but as more time has passed and I've used it more and more and I've seen it more and more, uh, is that when we're recording and uploading a presentation or uploading a project or something to the discussion board for our classmates to view and share and comment, not only are they using technology tools that are a, a great set for them to know how to do, but they also get to respond uh, with thoughts and questions about what their classmates have created 
after some reflection, uh, when we're in a, a face to face classroom setting and there's a, a presentation, a group gives a presentation, you get about one minute for anybody in the class to ask questions or provide comments before we have to move on to the next one because we're limited by time. Um, the class will end and we only have a certain set amount of time. So if you have somebody in your class that, that wants to sit back and reflect and review and really get into what was presented and then develop questions or a response or, or you know, really get into what the other group said, that's hard in a minute. Um, that's hard for anybody in a minute. Um, but it's definitely a challenge for people that, that need that extra level of reflection. Well, if it's posted within a D2L discussion board and they can go to it on their own time, in their own time, review it and develop however they want to respond, you're actually creating a more inclusive learning environment for those group presentations in an online environment than you actually were in your face-to-face -face class, which is kind of a cool benefit that comes from it. And I think it'd be a great place to use video note too, as well for those responses. So you can see and hear those questions and comments. Oh, absolutely. Um, That's a great <clears throat> idea. <laughs> but you've talked a lot about groups and we've talked about group discussions and group projects, but what about grading? If you create a group assignment folder or you create a group discussion, you can grade it as a group. But what if you just have those that don't participate? Because even in the real world, we have team members who don't always pull their own weight. Uh, so how do you deal with that when you're trying to grade these groups in D2L? Such a great question. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never had anybody <laughs> not pull their own weight. Right? <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that that's really a very common thing that um, people ask about a lot, and it's the how do we address the grading um, within D2L um, group grading is available within discussion and assignment folders. And as I mentioned earlier, that's where you can uh, you go and you post one grade and general feedback and it goes to everybody that you assign to that group. It's uh, it's pretty quick. And one of the benefits of it is that uh, typically, especially in like a group presentation or a group project, about 80 to 90 percent of the feedback that you're going to give on the project is generic to everyone in the group. So if you are giving group feedback, you're not having to go in and retype or say or record or however it is that you give your feedback over and over and over again the same information. You can put that out there one time and everybody in the group gets it at one time. So that part is pretty fantastic. Um, on that, if you do have somebody who isn't participating, you've got a couple of options. Uh, one of those is that even if you use the group grading and it it assigns everyone a grade into the grade book, uh, you can go in and manually override an individual's grade and then uh, add additional feedback as to why you gave them the grade that you did. Um, so that is, is definitely an option if you have somebody that did not participate or uh, did not do a good job with their participation at all, you can go in and do that. Uh, and then one of the other things that I've seen that I think has been really helpful and kind of brought a new level within um, how we are grading some of these group projects and things through an online environment is we've used peer evaluations in the past um, and we have used them, you know, in class, you go through and you circle some bubbles and uh, you turn that in and that's how someone is graded on their involvement in the class or even how our own course evaluations are done. We can do those in an online environment as well. And, and, that's one of those things that at the end of this, we're going to actually give you all some resources and we'll be sure to give you all some resources that we have on peer evaluation. Um, but one of those through peer evaluation is that students can evaluate their classmates and that be part of the actual grade. Um, there's a couple different ways to do that. You can go in and override the grade for that individual student. Or one of the ways that I like to do it, and I've found this really kind of works best for me as a faculty member, is that um, I kind of set up the two different grades. I set up the one that is the actual group project that gets the group grade, that gets the group feedback. And then I have a second one that is a percentage of the overall. Um, and within that students to the assignment folder drop in some peer evaluation forms that I have and then I use those to give the extra 
points uh, or remove points if necessary uh, from a participant who did not do what they were supposed to do within their group project. Not only does that give you a chance to really deal with students that didn't do their part, but it also gives uh, the other members of the group an opportunity to feel heard and valued because as a faculty member, you're not there at every meeting. You're not there at every conversation. You may have actually never participated in any of the conversations. Uh, so you don't know all of those small details that happen behind the scenes. And this gives that opportunity for a student's voice to be heard and for them to have some additional value. Uh, one of the other points to make about uh, people not participating and grading, and this is sometimes kind of a hard one, um, is that as faculty, at least I have this problem, I don't want my students to not be successful. I want to do everything that I can to help them be successful. I use all kinds of methods, both within D2L and out, to try to really motivate students to engage in their activities and things like that. It's important to note, however, that some students choose to fail. Uh, and we do actually have to give them the opportunity to not be successful. Uh, so if a, choose, if a student chooses not to participate in an activity or not to participate in a discussion, that's not a failure on our part as a faculty member. That is that the that student is choosing not to engage to the fullest level. Um, so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as you're thinking about activities and getting people to participate that sometimes students make that choice. I agree. It's hard to draw that line when you want to try and motivate them and get them involved and you do everything you can and they just aren't wanting to be involved. It's a hard, it's a hard line. You have to just let go. Mm -hmm. um, well, I really appreciate all of that feedback. My last question really is about what other types of activities um, can you do in D2L using groups that, you know, for courses that are that are larger in nature? Oh, absolutely. Um, we've seen all kinds of great things. And actually, we're kind of hoping that um, anyone else that has uh, been a part of this chat will feel free to communicate on some things they may have seen. But here are just a few that uh, I've witnessed over the last few years. Uh, one is debates. You can actually set up classroom debates through the D2L discussion tool. It takes a little bit of management up front, uh, but once you get it set up, it's, it's actually pretty neat. And the different groups can debate in the same way that you would in a face-to-face uh, -face environment with time limits on responses and different levels and rebuttals and things like that. And it really actually does work in D2L discussions. You got to, again, be pretty upfront about your instructions, but I've seen it work really well um, and how students are engaging with each other through that process. Another example could be class projects, um, ones that are like semester long projects that everybody in the class is working on or everybody's doing a different part. Uh, if you kind of set that up as a self-enrollment option within groups, that actually gives students a chance to choose their group um, and choose what it is they're going to work on. Uh, so I mentioned earlier about not everybody loves video. Um, so if part of this class project is a video and you do not want to do that, then you may want to go in there early and select the one that is not that um, so that you're really able to do the thing where you feel most confident and comfortable and be successful within a class activity. Um, another one that I've seen is book groups. Um, I have seen this a couple times in graduate classes, but I bet you it would work in undergraduate classes actually was just thinking that children's literature would be kind of awesome as a book group discussion board activity. Um, but it's where you have those external books that in order for everybody not to have to read all of the same book or for you to have a, a more broad conversation about a book group, again, that's hard. If the group is too big, people kind of feel lost in it. But if you can break it down to a smaller group that can really deeply engage, and then after they have those engagements, they post something to a more general board so that those that weren't in the smaller of the groups are able to really see what was happening and what the other groups said about the information. Um, it's just a great way for them to have more depth and breadth of the information from those book groups. And then one that a faculty member suggested to me, and uh, I think it's brilliant, and I have been using it since then, is study groups. 
And initially that may seem a little strange, but it's really going in and setting it up as, as a discussion board, setting it up as a chat, um, using video note, uh, whatever resource it is that you're using, but then putting it in a place where students can get to it, whether it's that they participate in real time or they get, you've recorded it and they get to it later, taking about an hour uh, as a faculty member and really focusing on an area that um, has been, been confusing in the past or that students sometimes stumble over some of the concepts, having that as a really in-depth moment where they can engage with it, um, that they can ask additional questions, that they can talk to each other, they can talk to you, um, that takes that hour and it's really important that you think about that in terms of that's an hour, you're taking one hour, but if five, six, seven, ten students go in and participate in that study group in that one hour in whatever format they choose to participate, that's still just one hour. If you do it individually per student, that's five, six, seven, ten hours that you're spending as a faculty member going over the same information on the same topic. So really thinking about what that looks like and how you can best use your time also really helps benefit your students. And I mentioned a second ago about that we would love to hear some other information from y'all, ways that you might have been using groups in the past. So uh, Tara and I would like to encourage you to get on Twitter and share some of your ideas. So using the hashtag groups in D2L, let us know some ideas that you've had or things that you've seen be successful in terms of groups in medium and large enrollment classes. You can add some small ones too. That'd be great. Um, but do also don't forget to add the hashtag uh, D2L Fusion, and then to tag at D2L, and go ahead and tag us too, because we'd love to hear what's going on out there at MTSU Online. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tara, for joining me today. You had such great questions that really helped us convey some information. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate participating.